Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, a podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 29, October 4th through October 10th, 1861. Before we get going, just a little quick note. We are posting the next Patreon episode this week, so that should be popping up in the Patreon feed. Check out the link in the description if you want to see what that's all about. This one is another movie review, a little synopsis and review of a appropriate Civil War movie, so make sure to check that out. And uh, once again, of course, support for the show is greatly appreciated. Last week, we looked at the Battle of Greenbrier River in western Virginia and took a look at the Crimean War and its significance as compared to the American Civil War. This week, we get to head to Florida first before we get into a discussion about ironclads and their creation, as well as talk about the Cherokees and their alliance with the Confederacy. First, let's head to Pensacola. This week, we will discuss the Battle of Santa Rosa Island, occurring near Pensacola, Florida. I feel like we very briefly glossed over Fort Pickens, which was overshadowed by Fort Sumter. If you recall, when the first wave of southern states left the Union, there were only a few possessions still in federal hands. Fort Pickens was one such fort. In fact, if you recall, part of the Sumter Relief Expedition was rerouted to Florida to help defend Pickens. The fort had been around since the beginning of its construction in 1829. In the newly acquired territory of Florida, the fort was important to the protection of Pensacola Bay, which was considered to be one of the more important ports in the Americas, especially along the Gulf. It was very close to another key Confederate port of Mobile, which will play a part in our story yet to come. Nearby Pensacola had a history longer than the lifespan of the United States up until this point. Spanish exploration of the area went back to the 1500s and colonization back to the 1600s. The area changes hands several times, leading up to an American assault at the end of the War of 1812. At the time of its completion, Pickens, named for a revolutionary figure from South Carolina, was the largest brick structure on the Gulf of Mexico. Now, Confederate forces are staring from the panhandle of Florida at the Union-controlled Fort Pickens on Santa Rosa Island. Their commander was one Braxton Bragg. If we are going to talk about Santa Rosa Island, then we might as well use it as an excuse to introduce another major figure of the war in Braxton Bragg. Braxton Bragg was born in North Carolina in 1817. He graduated near the top of his class at West Point in 1837, amongst several other future Civil War generals. He would go on to serve in the Seminole War, as well as in Mexico. It was in Mexico where Bragg would perform well as an artillery commander, earning the admiration of the Mississippi Regiment, commanded by one Jefferson Davis. Bragg would not be liked by all, though. Reportedly, his men hated his strict discipline so much they attempted to set up an accidental shooting of their superior. This theme of Bragg not getting along with his subordinates will continue, so keep that in mind. In fact, if we Take a look at the Patreon and Sam Watkins in his memoir, Company H. There was some criticism of Bragg and some talk about his disciplinary measures and how they did not necessarily jive with the men under his command. So shameless plug there. Go ahead 
and check that out. Before the Civil War, Braxton would resign his commission to become a plantation owner in Louisiana. Bragg will rise to become commander of the Army of Tennessee. I don't want to give too much away, but eventually Jefferson Davis will refuse his resignation. That should give you a clue as to how well that command goes. Bragg would survive the war and relocate to Mobile, Alabama, and then to Galveston, Texas. It was in Galveston where he would drop dead while taking a walk in 1876. Bragg's capability as a commander is a common topic of discussion. Jefferson Davis is usually criticized for sticking too long with the North Carolinian in the West. I know I like the baseball analogies, but it's kind of like starting a pitcher who is getting rocked and the manager is like, eh, let's just let him try to figure it out. Anyway, I'll let you be the judge as our story unfolds. In October of 1861, Bragg would send Richard Anderson, along with around 1,000 men, to invade Santa Rosa Island and attack Camp Brown, which lay a little to the east of the fort. Anderson had attended West Point before serving in Mexico. The South Carolinian was served throughout the war, his command being virtually annihilated before the final surrender at Appomattox. Because of this, he was actually sent home a day before the final surrender. The planned attack on the camp was a retaliation to the Federal forces having burned a Confederate ship being built called the Judah. Harvey Brown commanded men from New York along with U.S. regulars. Brown was a career soldier and would go on to command New York City during the draft riots later in the war. The six New York were known as Wilson Suaves and apparently were a very tough group. It was said a requirement for joining the regiment was having done hard time. At 3.30 a.m., Anderson's men were able to successfully surprise the Yankees and drive them through the camp, the New Yorkers taking the brunt of the assault. Brown ordered a counterattack using his four companies of regulars to push the rebels out. The Southerners had stopped to loot their enemy before setting up a defensive position in order to meet the new attack by fresh northern troops. Anderson had realized that Fort Pickens could not be taken by force and withdraw his men back to their landing site before daybreak. The Confederates would escape, still under fire, back to Pensacola, using the same three barges they had come in on. Around 150 casualties were suffered by both sides, although as is true with many engagements in the early part of the war, those numbers were greatly inflated for the purposes of the papers. In terms of a raid, we can safely say it was mildly successful. The Confederates did surprise the enemy and maybe in some ways avenge an earlier Union action. They did not drive the Northerners from the island, and they did not take Fort Pickens, however. Both sides would claim victory, as is our normal course of action during this early part of the war. I do want to talk about the creation of ironclad vessels, because on October 4th, the USS Monitor would officially be ordered. When I say that, I mean the Navy would seek the construction of the famous vessel. The story of how we got to that point, though, is pretty interesting. Now, as we will discuss here in a minute, there were inspirations for ironclad vessels across the pond. We mentioned back that the Confederacy was fortunate to have saved the whole of the Merrimack, soon to be CSS Virginia. The reason this was important was that the hull sat below the waterline. We have already mentioned why this is important 
but the Confederacy and Stephen Mallory decided to combine the whole with metal armor to create an ironclad of their own. 723 tons of iron went to the creation of the vessel. The United States needed a response, otherwise there was a real fear this vessel would wreak havoc on the blockading fleet. I've seen a quote that was to the effect that the Virginia would sail up the Potomac and start lobbing shells at the White House itself. Citizens from the private sector were asked to submit designs for ironclad vessels. One such man who received a contract was Connecticut-born Cornelius Bushnell. Bushnell had seen success in taking over a bankrupt New Haven and New London Railroad. While lobbying in Washington, he caught the attention of Gideon Wells and President Lincoln. The railroad man received a contract after taking over a shipyard. The first design accepted by the Navy would become the USS Galena, an armored frigate. Bushnell would model the Galena on the HMS Warrior and the French armored frigate Glory. These were the first two ironclad vessels in Europe. The French had started to construct their warship in 1858, which created a panic in Britain that the French were getting ready to invade. This prompted the creation of the warrior and her sister ship, the Black Prince. Design was simple. The hull would be made of iron and include the interior of the ship to be encased in a reinforced iron box. Called the Citadel, when all said and done, it would be two feet thick. Workers labored steadily in Portsmouth, and by 1860, the Warrior was complete. It weighed some 960 tons, fitted with 202 plates. Just based off the firing platform, the Warrior could have an effective range 100 feet longer than any other warship of its time. Aboard the vessel was a wide variety of armament. Even with impressive firepower, the warrior was actually never engaged in combat. It would soon become obsolete, but certainly could have inspired Civil War ironclads. HMS Warrior is actually on display in Portsmouth, England, if you are ever in the area and want to see it. Cornelius Bushnell would most likely have wanted to take a peek. For his ironclad design in the USS Galena, he was running into a bit of an issue. So new were these vessels that many thought they would surely sink their first time out on the water. Bushnell would need to consult an expert to make sure his design could float. But where could such a man be found? Enter John Erickson. Erickson was born in Sweden in 1803. From an early age, he showed gifts of being a very talented inventor. While in England, he would work on engines propelled by heat and steam. Erickson would partner with an English inventor to enter several locomotive trials for speed. While in England, the Swede would get married, but would not work out. The inventor was quoted as saying that if his wife was around more than she was, he would not have as much time to get things done. And I'm no expert in the matter, but I probably would not have gone with that quote myself. U.S. Navy Admiral David Stockton would meet Erickson, and the two would become partners. Stockton would gain fame, leading the U.S. Navy expedition to conquer California during the war with Mexico. In the 1830s, they began work on a screw-propelled ship, eventually named the USS Princeton. Relations would sour, and this is not surprising. While building the Monitor, the Navy would send David Dixon Porter to evaluate the progress. Erickson would give the naval officer an incredibly tough time 
and say he knew nothing about the readings of his designs or plans and sort of made it clear that he was not approving of David Dixon Porter showing up to be the one to review his work. Not worthy was he. Surprisingly, Porter would give a mostly positive review of the Monitor. Stockton designed guns for the Princeton, the largest of which was named the Peacemaker. President Tyler would cruise in the Princeton along with his staff. Upon a second firing of the Peacemaker, the gun misfired, resulting in the deaths of the Secretary of State, Abel Upshur, and the Secretary of the Navy, Thomas Walker Gilmer as well as President Tyler's longtime valet, a black slave named Armistead. If you remember Thomas Hart Benton, John C. Fremont's father-in-law, the politician actually suffered ear damage as a result of the incident. President Tyler was below deck, fortunately for him, and actually married the daughter of one of the victims. Stockton would attempt to pass all the blame onto John Erickson, which did result in the inventor not receiving his full pay. And actually, John Erickson was not present on the ship at the time, having been left behind by Stockton, sort of a move to make Stockton seem more important than Erickson. So, a fun fact there. There was definitely a black mark on Erickson's record, but it would be Erickson whose help Bushnell would seek in the design for his ironclad. Almost in passing, the Swede offered to show Bushnell his design for an ironclad vessel, and he would present the Connecticut man with a wooden model of what would become the Monitor. The hull was below the waterline with a rotating turret that could fire two guns. It was nothing like anyone had seen up until that point, and Bushnell loved it. He would seek to partner with Erickson and show the design to the Naval Department. Erickson was not going to trust the U.S. Navy after Stockton's efforts to discredit him. Therefore, he would not go to Washington to argue for his design. Bushnell would do so on their behalf. He would not be originally successful, not getting past all of the members of the review board. Bushnell would need the inventor himself to come and convince the board, but to do so, he would need to tell a little lie. He actually would inform Erickson that they were approved, and they loved the design, and the lack of approval coming as a shock to the Swede when he arrived in Washington. Fortunately, he was able to turn things around, and the fact that President Lincoln was an inventor himself did very much to helping the matter. Lincoln would give his approval, and work on the monitor would begin. In October, the Cherokee Nation would sign a treaty with the Confederacy. Remember, the Cherokees had relocated from the southeast. They would secede from the Union, drawing a declaration themselves. Disenfranchised by the Trail of Tears, and fearing that the federal government would open Oklahoma for white settlement drove them to the decision. Remember, also, they had formed more relationships with Southerners and shared more of their culture than that of the North. Besides the overall impression that the Confederacy offered better treatment, the Confederates also offered a set of courts in Indian Territory more than what was offered by America. Oklahoma had a little mini-civil war between those supporting Confederates and Union. Means he that stands on two feet was the leader of the Confederate forces of the Cherokee Nation. That is what the name means, but we know him as Stand Wati, who was born in Georgia. Buck Wati was his brother and who had gone north to school. Buck had advocated for the removal to the west in order to provide a better life for his tribe, especially away from alcohol. 
Because of this, his brother was actually killed. Stan would seek vengeance and fight against his rivals. Stan Wati learned English and served in Cherokee Supreme Court before the outbreak of the Civil War. His son would be the representative of the Cherokee at the Confederate Congress, as a matter of fact. Stan Wadi would create a mounted rifle unit, the Cherokee Mounted Rifles. They would play a big role in the Battle of Pea Ridge early in 1862. Cherokees would change sides later in the war and spark their own conflicts in Oklahoma. Stan Wadi was named a Brigadier General, the only Native American to gain that rank during the war. During which time, he was able to set up a large ambush and capture a large amount of Union supplies, as well as steal horses, so many so that there were some Union cavalry units that were actually forced to become infantry. Stan Wati would actually be the final Confederate general to surrender after Appomattox. Let's wrap it up there for today. We talked about the action of Santa Rosa Island and introduced Braxton Bragg. We also mentioned the creation of the Ironclads and introduced the designer of the monitor, John Erickson. We finish with a brief rundown of the Cherokee Nation, siding with the Confederacy, as well as introduce Stan Wati. Next week, we will go over a few smaller events before having discussion to update us on world events early in 1862. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, and Venmo information. Once again, there is a new episode that's going to be posted to the Patreon, so make sure to check that out if you're interested. Support for the general upkeep of the show is welcomed. Once again, feedback is appreciated. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week. <laughs>